right, I don't have any results for you. We're still enrolling at this point, but we're very excited about this study and are, um, I'm excited to share with you what we're doing. Uh, so uh, again, my name is Tanda Meehan and I'm the trial coordinator for the posterior fossa decompression with or without duroplasty for Chiari type one malformation and syringomyelia. Um, that's a big mouthful. So we call it the PFD, PFDD trial. Uh, so this is a great debate among pediatric neurosurgeons. This question is probably the most active, ongoing debate in the Chiari surgical community right now. Uh, I am a small piece of a rather large team, and at Washington University, uh, Dr. David Limbrick uh, at St. Louis Children's Hospital is our lead investigator for the trial. TME Bethel Anderson is our data monitor, and um, she has been a tremendous resource to all of our sites and an integral part of all our team. I'm going to elaborate more on her role in a little bit. And Josh Shimoni is our radiologist, and um, I know I really need to give him loads of credit. He reads hundreds and hundreds of scans for us. Uh, so uh, I can't forget him. There are many more people involved in this study out in Iowa and at Vanderbilt and then across the centers that are involved and we'll talk more about this as we continue. Surgical decompression, PFD or PFDD. The question that we're trying to answer is whether it is necessary to open the dura during the decompression surgery. Um, I think a lot of you already know, but the dura is that watertight outer covering of the brain and the spinal cord. With the Chiari malformation and syringomyelia, it's typically treated with a neurosurgical decompression of the craniovertebral junction with one of two different techniques. The first being the posterior fossa decompression with the duroplasty, and that's the PFDD. This has been the gold standard operation. It involves a intradural microsurgical dissection with the duroplasty. Um, so if you, it's where the surgeon will cut through the dura, a patch is sewn in, and the dura surface is expanded. The second procedure is the extradural posterior fossa decompression, also known as the PFD. And this is a bony decompression that involves removing part of the bone and cutting the epidural band to relieve the pressure and create more space without entering the dura. Um, with this study, we're hoping to determine if PFD will be associated with fewer surgical complications and less harm to our patients. We want to know how clinical improvement, syrinx regression, the rate of surgical revision, and the quality of life differs between the two surgical techniques. Uh, we are focused on the pediatric population with this study. So currently, the general consensus among neurosurgeons is that if you have a Chiari one with a syrinx and it is symptomatic, then it does require surgery. Unfortunately, the literature about what surgery is best is rather ambiguous, and there's really no consensus on the procedural steps which would lead to a consistently favorable outcome in Chiari 1 patients. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see this, uh, but it's a retrospective study from 2008 that was asking similar questions to what we are looking at. And here's a little synopsis of it. Um, Interoperative and postoperative complication rates are about 2% in PFD and 18% in PFDD. The need for surgical revision, however, is about 12.3% for the PFD patients and only 5% in PFDD. Uh, we do see there is uh, inverse, um, the, the surgical revision increases inversely with the age of the child, uh, meaning that as the child gets older, the rate of revision typically goes down. Uh, clinical improvements are, in the past, have typically been reported by the physician, and um, the studies that we have aren't always specific to the pediatric population. There is not much data out there on the quality of life. 
And then finally, um, that PFDD is associated with higher rates of neurological complications, CSF leaks, pseudomeningeal seals, aseptic meningitis, and longer operating room and recovery time. But the PFDD may also be associated with a higher rate of clinical improvement. So our trial is a cluster randomized control trial of 148 patients. We have 42 research centers, and it is the largest study of its kind uh, because of all of these sites. Each site has been assigned a specific procedure for the study. However, um, if the allocated surgery isn't preferred, then the patient would not be included in our data collection process. These are the 42 members of the Park Reeves Consortium. Uh, this is a consortium that was formed many years ago, and it's a database that, a database that consists of 1,500 Chiari patients around North America, and 36 of these particular sites, plus an additional seven, are involved in the PFD-PFDD trial. And what this means is that about 65% of the neurosurgeons in this country are involved in our trial and helping us to answer this question. So what are the aims of our study? Well, the first aim is to determine if PFD is associated with fewer surgical complications than PFDD. Secondly, we'd like to determine if PFD provides a non-inferior clinical improvement in syrinx regression. And finally, we are determining if PFD is associated with a superior quality of life compared to PFDD. Um, AIM-1, our anticipated outcome, is that the surgical complications um, as you know, CSF leaks, pseudomeningeal seals, et cetera, um, and the requirement for additional surgery for wound revision or CSF diversion would be lower after the PFD. And how we're measuring these outcomes is we're acquiring all of the data on any intraoperative complications, as well as collecting on the postoperative complications in the short and long term leading out to a year. The second aim of this study is uh, we're comparing the rates of revision for the decompression surgery and also looking at spinal deformity after the PFD. And we're hoping to see, um, or we're anticipating we might see that the PFD will also be non-inferior to PFDD. We're looking, um, clinical symptoms and neurological functions are being measured, again, preoperatively and longitudinally postoperatively. We're looking at the effect of the surgery on the syrinx size, the spinal deformity, and we're obtaining MRIs uh, both pre and at 12 months. Uh, and then, of course, documenting the need for any revisions um, postoperatively uh, related to the Chiari malformations. Okay, and thirdly, we are holistically evaluating our patients across a psychosocial psycho and physical dimensions. We're using two quality of life tools, the Chiari Health Index of Pediatrics, um, also known as the CHIP, and the Health Utilities Index, or the HUE-3. Uh, quality of life is difficult to assess in the pediatric population. Um, most commonly, outcomes were measured using a gestalt method, which means that the person who was determining if there was improvement was the surgeon. And most of the reports that were coming out previously were based on physician accounts, not necessarily the patient accounts, and that has a risk for bias. So the CHIP was developed in 2016 by our collaborators at Vanderbilt University, and it is a 45-question instrument that assesses levels of pain and other physical improvements, but it also looks at the psychosocial element, including anxiety, the ability of the child to make friends, can they keep up with their peers, are they frustrated with life. So in order to define the appropriate candidates for this study, we asked what criteria would help us 
answer our questions without contributing to any bias. And I knew there was a lot of debate with the neurosurgeons and uh, patient partners to really fine tune the appropriate criteria. And this is what they came up with. Um, the, the, the age is anyone less than 21 years of age. Um, the Chiari malformation would be uh, greater than five millimeters tonsillar ectopy, which is the definition of a Chiari one, essentially. And the syrinx size would be between three and 10 millimeters in diameter at its largest point. Um, Exclusion-wise, um, again, if the syrinx is out of range, if the neuroimaging demonstrates basal or invagination or a clival canal angle of less than 120 degrees. Um, also, an individual would be excluded if they have had prior Chiari surgeries um, or anyone who doesn't want to participate. Uh, in addition, if the family or surgeon feels that their randomized procedure might not be the best for this particular individual, they would be excluded from the study. And on that note, we are collecting um, all of the reasons in a large database as to why someone might not participate in this study. We're hoping that this might have valuable information for us in the future. Once a participant is a, enrolled in the trial, these are the time points of the data collection. Preoperatively, we will uh, gather their demographic characteristics, their um, any other medical illnesses or complications, a full neurological history and clinical exam, as well as the CHIP and Huey, which are the quality of life indicators. Um, and then we will have radiographic imaging, usually an MRI, of the Chiari, the syrinx, and the spine, where we can see the Cobb angle. Once the patient is randomized um, and have their procedure, and I do want to add on one note, um, because this randomization is by sight, the individuals that are enrolling in the study know in advance which procedure they're going to have prior to going into the operating room. Um, and this is nice because in the past, um, or in other studies, um, sometimes you don't know until the surgeon goes into the operating room uh, what procedure would happen. And um, this is nice because I think you have a little bit more control as a patient whether or not you want to participate. Um, but postoperatively, we'll see them at one month, three to six months, and again at 12 months for the follow-up. Um, during all those time points, we'll again collect the quality of life, Chip and Huey's, uh, record any history of, or symptoms that have happened, um, document any complications or um, any need for surgical revisions, and um, any other surgeries. And then finally, again, at the 12-month period, we will collect the imaging to compare it with the preoperative imaging. Since we don't have results now, we'll tell you how we're gonna make sure our results are good. Um, so in order to make certain that we provide honest and legitimate results, we have imposed upon ourselves a thorough system of checks and balances, and the first, takes place during the data collection, and this is where my data monitor is really important. She goes through all of the documentation, uh, compares it with the surgical notes and the uh, clinical notes to make sure that everything is thorough and all the questions have been answered. Um, she'll look at each individual at each site to do this. And then after the 12-month data has been submitted, we will, um, it will be reviewed by an adjudication committee. And the adjudication process is important to ensure the high quality study results. It includes a stringent procedures uh, to make sure that the endpoint determinations um, are solid. So with this being a neuro neurosurgical study, our adjudication committee consists of two pediatric neurosurgeons and a pediatric neuroradiologist. These individuals are um, blinded to uh, the data, meaning that they don't know what site the data has come from or what patient it's come from. And they are independent and impartial. They have no other role in this study but to evaluate the legitimacy of our data collection. Um, and finally, the committee ensures accuracy of the protocol-defined events. 
they make sure that we enrolled appropriate candidates for this study, that the interpretations of the radiological images are consistent, and that the subjective data has been documented thoroughly. Um, so where are we at? Like I said, we're still in the enrollment process. Um, it will continue until we have either enrolled 148 participants or December 31st. We currently have 134 participants enrolled, so hopefully um, you know, our analysis will get underway much quicker. Um, then there will be a year follow-up, um, which will take us again to next December, and then um, again, hopefully we'll have some preliminary data results for you in 2020. So we designed this study with patient partners and advocacy groups and realized that the information that's going to be obtained is of great importance to all of you. Um, you guys are faced with making these uh, critical decisions at a time of a lot of stress with a new diagnosis. Um, so how will this impact um, all of you? And what we're hoping is that we're going to answer the unanswerable questions. Which procedures have higher risks? Which is more likely to harm my child? Which is more likely to help? Uh, sometimes these are the same procedures. Will my child have to go through this more than once? Uh, we want to identify the surgical approach that will minimize surgical complications and minimize the harm to our patients, and that will maximize the symptomatic relief and syrinx resolution. Uh, and we want to provide the highest quality of life for all of our patients. And finally, we really hope to empower all of you. Um, we want to create a shift away from the current reliance on either surgical preference or perhaps the surgeon does the procedure based simply on how they were trained and aren't familiar with other ways and give everyone some level one data that will um, address the risks and benefits of both procedures. So um, thank you to Caitlin and Dorothy and the CSF Foundation. Um, PCORI is funding our trial. I know all of you heard from them earlier. Um, and um, good luck to all of you guys tomorrow at Capitol Hill. I hope you make a difference. Um, I will say, um, if you're in St. Louis, I'll do a little plug <laughs> on August 18th. We are having a family workshop um, where we are, um, we have some speakers coming in to talk about how to have a productive relationship with your schools and your employers and how to transition adult children um, um, with um, key RNA malformations. So thank you.